pregnant pause. Hello, everybody. Let's try that again. Hello, everybody. Woo! Um, it is a beautiful day outside, and it is a great privilege to have you inside with us um, to the Berkman Klein Center's event, Seven Fellows Predict the Future. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, we are here to celebrate the Berkman Klein Center's fellows from this year, the 2022-2023 cohort, um, and the research that they've conducted this year. Before we begin, I want to note that we have two cameras that are recording today's session. It will live on the Berkman Klein site for perpetuity as long as the internet exists, um, or the Berkman Klein Center exists after this. Um, so I'm Rebecca Kadaski, I use she, her pronouns, I'm the director of the uh, Berkman Klein, director of community at the Berkman Klein Center, um, a place that I've called home for the past 17 years. Um, and this event makes me so proud and so happy. Um, this is our first cohort of fellows to join us physically at the center since Harvard opened up, um, since the pandemic began. They've helped us to break in our new Lewis office, to break things, to find what's broken, what needs to be broken, what's fixable, what works. Um, they've helped us to reflect on and redefine our fellows program as the center entered our 25th year. Um, this is also the first cohort of fellows selected and designed with Sue Hendrickson, our executive director at the Berkman Client Center. We also celebrate tonight. And let me pass the mic to Sue to give a welcome to you all. Thank you all for coming out. I'm uh, so excited to see so many people and to celebrate such an extraordinary collection of fellows. Um, one of the things that's most awesome about this job is the ability to bring in extraordinary people with extraordinary ideas and help them actualize those ideas and take them out into the world and launch them in new ways. We've had this group exploring issues of digital transformation, intellectual property, migration, um, communication, uh, the, ways that, the ways that technology and society interact. It's been an extraordinary collection of thought leadership in that, an amazing group of people. And I'm just honored to be here and looking forward to their reflections and the ways that they're going to change the world both today and in the future. <laughs> So um, as ever, we weren't exactly sure what this year would hold for the center and for our fellows as we re-entered the realm of the physical in the midst of this pandemic. Um, and we never really know how our fellows will vibe with one another when we select them. There's a little bit of alchemy, a little bit of guessing, a little bit of hope that we inject into the process. Um, trusting on all of you, trusting on the fellows to work with one another, to learn from one another. Um, it's one of the most scary and one of the most joyous parts of my job is to take this leap of faith with all of you. Um, one of the things that we do know is that we assembled a remarkable group of people who are committed to the public interest, um, both in this fellows cohort and in the other cohorts that we design and bring together at the Berkman Klein Center that's really crucial for us. Um, and I remember speaking during our kickoff about fighting fascism and the responsibility that we all hold with the privileges that we have to study systems of power and how they use technology. Similarly, I remember speaking about the power that individuals and communities hold when they come together, learn from one another, and speak up through things like fellowship, through things like this event. Um, I'm ex so excited to hear from the fellows tonight as they help us understand the ways that we can all play roles in designing the future that we want. Um, so, without further ado, we're going to start. So first up, uh, we will welcome Elizabeth Dubois, who's an Associate Professor and University Research Chair in Politics, Communication, and Technology at the University of Ottawa. She hosts the Wonks and War Rooms podcast, which you should sign up for, subscribe to, give five stars, all the good things. Elizabeth. All right, so today I'm going to talk about social media influencers in politics and election campaigns, and I'm going to convince you that this is something we need to be worried about. Social media influencers are a new type of independent third-party endorser who shape audience attitudes through 
blogs, tweets, other uses of social media. Political social media influencers do all that, but you know, for politics. There are influencers who create their entire online brand, their entire persona around being political, around having a political opinion. There are other influencers who talk about politics only here and there. Their brand isn't actually to do with politics, but at certain moments, it comes as part of what they do. Influencers can be big or small. We have micro-influencers, as is the case in all three of these news articles here. But there's also mega-influencers that look a lot more like celebrities, and nano-influencers that look a lot more like people like you and I who might have a very small but committed following of friends and family who pay attention to us. The appeal of using social media influencers in campaigns is pretty clear. From a reach perspective, social media influencers can give a campaign access to a wider variety of folks, often folks that they couldn't access on their own. Influencers also typically have a very detailed and nuanced understanding of their particular fan base, which means that using influencers can be very akin to you doing micro-targeting. There's also something special about the relationship influencers have with their followers and fans. These are people who have cultivated relationships, and so there are social dynamics, parasocial interactions, and sometimes that celebrity status. When we're thinking about why we should pay attention to political influencers, I want to highlight how important it is that we understand how different political actors act within our democratic systems. It's important to know how these new actors are interacting. And it's important to know that social media influencers can be used for pro and counter democratic things. Get out the vote campaigns and disinformation cam campaigns are equally affected by these kinds of strategies. So my first thought was, what kinds of laws and regulations actually exist? If it's important for us to understand these political actors' role in the system, maybe we should figure out whether or not our existing regulatory approaches are equipped to deal with them. And the answer is like, not really. <laughs> what we see when we look at the existing laws and regulations is that they're divided into two main groups and there's only very few of them. One is around election advertising and election spending. It's all about payment. If money isn't exchanged, probably it's not being counted. And then the other is in terms of consumer protection and competition law. Here the idea is influencers more broadly have to make uh, announcements about disclosure and endorsement. And so that impacts influencers regardless of whether an election is happening. I want to suggest that those approaches that focus on influencers as advertisers is too limited for a political context. In a political context, we need to think about a bunch of different kinds of roles that these influencers can play. So celebrity endorsers, Influencers who have a big enough audience look a lot like celebrity endorsers. And so then maybe we think we should treat influencers just like them. But the problem is celebrities rarely make, uh, rarely accept financial contributions from campaigns or payment because they're celebrities and they don't need to. But influencers do <laughs> want to make money. It's their job. That's how they set up that gig. And so in that case, if an influencer is being paid, they are much more clearly like an advertiser. And influencer marketing is a whole thing outside of politics that we do need to pay attention to. The thing is, there are specifics about political campaigns that we need to think about. For example, we have now political advertisement registries that most social media platforms and a number of other websites have to create. But right now, it's unclear whether or not most of those repositories would actually include social media influencer marketing and endorsements because of the technical backing behind those systems. Then we can think of the ways that influencers might be involved in campaigns that don't involve payment. When we're thinking about campaigns, volunteers make up a huge component of any political party's campaign and a lot of advocacy and activism campaigns. We think of door knocking, we think of phone banking, we think of hosting a backyard barbecue, all of these are instances where influencers might come into play. Those are usually run by volunteers who have been trained, they've been fed lines, they've been told what messages to communicate and how, what ones are important for the party at the moment. Influencers can be taught the same things. And in an online context, for example, when people had to campaign in the middle of COVID, relational influencer campaigns started to replace things like door knocking. 
And we started to see campaigns reaching out to their volunteer base and saying, can you share messages on social media? Can you send text messages? Can you send emails to all of your friends and family? And then, of course, there's folks who don't necessarily have a huge audience base, but they care about politics a whole bunch. The average Joes who also use social media and other communication tools to share their political ideas and information. These folks are called opinion leaders in commun political communication research. And they're thought of as these average folks who care more about politics than other people. They consume a lot of political information and then they share it out with their friends and family and everyday associates. And those people can be really powerful at communicating political messages because they have this shared understanding, these shared experiences that can curate information in a way that somebody who doesn't know someone personally just can't do. And so they're potentially really powerful in a political system. But when we're focusing just on payment, or how big your audience is, we totally miss their political role. So when we're thinking about social media influencers, I want you to think about their political role, not just about how big their audience is. Thinking about how big their audience is is absolutely the most common way to do it right now. It makes sense. Social media influencer marketing has been the most uh, popular approach and marketing agencies like quantifiable things. Follower numbers are quantifiable. But follower numbers are very dependent on the platform you're talking about, the particular jurisdiction you're talking about, the language you're talking about. And in politics, all of those things and a lot of other nuanced contextual information matters a whole bunch. So what's next? Well, I think that we need to update these categorization approaches. I think we can't keep defaulting to follower count, and we need to be thinking about the political roles that these individuals can play, regardless of their audience size, and importantly, thinking about the social and personal influence that they might be employing. In the existing frameworks for understanding social media influencers, this focuses on payment and advertising. If we are going to do that, and sometimes that is useful, sometimes that is important, if we're going to do that, we need better definitions of what counts as payment. We need to think more about what in-kind donations look like, how we actually measure that amount in a reasonable way in different contexts. We also need to set up structures to actually incorporate these kinds of advertisements. So we need to ask things like, hey, maybe our political advertising registries need updates in terms of what needs to be included. And if we think that's true, then tech companies have a bunch of work to do because technically that is a different kind of process. But I want to leave kind of on the bigger picture. I think we need to go beyond identifying these different uh, people based on their audiences and based on their advertisement and think about the roles that they are playing. The way that we do that is by asking how they are able to influence, what are the impacts of their different kinds of communication strategies, and then trying to map those out and understand that the idea of social media influencer is very broad. So the last thing I want to add here is the idea of social media influencer. I've spent a lot of time today talking about that, but in reality, social media influencers right now are acting on Discord and WhatsApp and Patreon and they have email newsletters and they also have events in person and online. It's not just about what they do on social media even if that's how we often conceptualize them and define them. So my predictions? Well, I think it's about to get messy. We're going to see more innovation in terms of integrating influencers into campaigns. That's both partisan campaigns and activist and advocacy campaigns. And so hopefully what I'm leaving you with today is a bit of a spark to think through what we do next. And I'll just end off with my last 15 seconds here with a call to check out my podcast, Wonks in War Rooms, where political communication theory meets on the ground strategy. I'm your host, Elizabeth Dubois. Um, you can find us anywhere you get your podcasts. Uh, and you can also check out the website paulcomtech.com where you can find out more about my research and the research that my lab does. Thank you all so much for your time.
Um, faith. Faith, my dear Faith. Um, faith Majikolagbe is an assistant professor at the University of Alberta Faculty of Law. Her research focuses on public interest issues in intellectual property and technology law, including issues related to access to knowledge and development. You will hear from her next. Ms. Faith. Good evening, everyone. Today, I will be talking about uh, what I believe could be the future of the global copyright system. So uh, in the last one year at Berkman, I have been looking at public interest um, activities as it relates to the global copyright system, and uh, I would be talking about those today. So to provide context, a bit of a context for today's talk, I'll take you through the past, the present, and what I believe should be the future of the global copyright system. Uh, the global copyright system came into being with the conclusion of the Berne Convention for Literary Works and Artistic Works in 1886. Um, the Berne Convention also created what we now call the Berne Union, and uh, the Berne Convention sought to create minimum standards for copyright protection in countries within the Berne Union and to ensure that creative works are protected in all countries globally, and also beyond the shores of the countries where um, a particular work has originated from. The original signatories to the Bern Convention were Belgium, France, Germany, Haiti, Italy, Liberia, Spain, Switzerland, and the UK. As you can see, most of these countries are today developed countries, and only a handful of developing countries were part of the Berne Convention when it was um, concluded. And despite the fact that developing countries did not um, join the uh, conclusion of the Berne Convention at the time, had, not, had, had no desire to join the Berne Convention, most developing countries early on quickly became parties to the Berne Convention because uh, they were co-opted into the system by their colonial masters without their own, um, without their desire. So they just kind of adopted the Berne Convention because the, their colonial masters extended the Berne Convention to those territories. And so even though the Berne Convention would not benefit these countries at the, at the time because it wasn't beneficial for them to have strong copyright protection, it was more beneficial for them to copy from foreign works and imitate foreign works and develop their own uh, cultural heritage and, and their own system of creative works and have access to uh, useful knowledge, they were made to protect works of their own countries and also works from foreign countries at the time. Interestingly, the United States did not join the Berne Convention until a century later. Why? Because the United States was smart and knew that uh, it would benefit more from being able to uh, copy and use and access works from other jurisdictions than from protecting works of other jurisdictions early on. So it was necessary for it to uh, develop up to a stage where it could absorb the cost of strong copyright protection. So as of May 2023, there are now 181 states or countries that are parties to the Berne Convention, and two thirds of these are developing countries. Again, even though developing countries do not necessarily benefit from a strong copyright system. Now, given, the implication, given that the implications of copyright protection varies from country to country and according to the developmental stage that a country is and also according to their development needs and priorities, uh, within the global copyright system, there has been a constant clash of what global copyright policy should look like and what global copyright policy should prioritize. And this clash has primarily been between developed countries and developing countries. Developed countries believe that we should prioritize strong copyright norms, whereas developing countries believe that we should prioritize norms that promote access to knowledge in those countries. But the dominance of developed countries, mind you, not in their number, but in their political strength and economic dominance um, and global influence, has seen the um, dominance of strong copyright rules at the international copyright system rather than norms that facilitate access to knowledge. 
Beyond the brand convention, which originally expanded the scope of copyright beyond territory, a particular local territory to the global system, we've seen the conclusion of the agreement on trade-related aspects of intellectual property, which we often call the TRIPS agreement, and also the WIPO internet treaties, that is the WIPO copyright treaty and the WIPO performances and pornogra pornographs treaties. Now, all of these treaties expand the scope of copyright protection and also uh, burden developing countries with minimum standards that they must comply with in protecting works that emanate from their countries and works that emanate outside their countries. Now, this has been done with little or no concession for developing countries with little or no flexibilities that could pro provide for access to knowledge in these countries. The only concession we've seen is the Brain Appendix, and the Brain Appendix has been criticized by lots of scholars, myself included, uh, as unworkable, as bureaucratic, and burdensome, and it has yielded no benefit whatsoever for developing countries. Now, since the start of the 21st century, developing countries have started using their numerical strength in the membership of the World Intellectual Property Organization to push their own agenda. In 2004, we saw developing countries uh, present a proposal before WIPO for a development agenda um, that would integrate a more holistic idea of development within the intellectual property organization. Now, a more holistic idea of development would um, view development beyond economic growth and also integrate human development priorities like access to knowledge, access to education within the non-certain activities of the World Intellectual Property Organization. In 2007, the WIPO development agenda was adopted and is now being implemented. implemented. Now, um, based on the back of the WIPO development agenda, the first thing we saw at the international copyright system is the Marrakesh Treaty to facilitate access to published works for persons who are blind, visually impaired, or otherwise print disabled. Now, prior to this time, persons who are uh, blind, visually impaired, or otherwise print disabled could not necessarily create accessible format copies for their use without getting the permission of copyright owners. And oftentimes, copyright owners do not also create markets that supply accessible format copies. Now, with the introduction of the Marrakesh Treaty, which was fought for by developing countries, uh, persons, organizations working with uh, this group of beneficiaries and even this group of beneficiaries can now create accessible format copies for, uh, for the purpose of accessing works in the way that other people access works without necessarily facing the constraints of copyright law. So this was a huge win, which was uh, basically fought for by developing countries at the international copyright system. Now, developing countries have continued their work of trying to find um, solutions to the access conundrum that we face uh, at the, within the global copyright system. And uh, in March 2023, we saw the African group present a proposal to the World Intellectual Property Organization that uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization should continue work to work, working towards an international treaty on copyright limitations and exceptions. Now, this treaty is significant in the sense that uh, without limitations and exceptions on the scope of copyright protection, what we would continue to have is an expansion of the scope of copyright protection without having uh, flexibilities that limit the scope of this protection and exempt certain uses, public interest uses, from the scope of copyright um, protection. Now, one may wonder why developing countries are currently prioritizing access over protection, whereas developed countries are prioritizing protection over access. Well, the reasons are not far-fetched. Uh, in terms of creativity and innovation, we see that unlimited grants of exclusive rights without appropriate corresponding limitations and exceptions have significant adverse implications for creativity and innovation. The strength of copyright oftentimes, times, if untamed, would adversely affect the way we create and innovate by raising the cost of borrowing and accessing materials that are the building blocks for creativity and innovation. In terms of access to knowledge and education, which is integral again to society progress and human development, um, this would largely be constrained where dissemination and use of um, knowledge materials are largely uh, subject to private monopoly. And having an educated population in developing countries, not this, as well as developed countries, will increase uh, human capital in most countries because a more educated population would be a more productive population. 
And lastly, which is a point that is often overlooked, is the fact that uh, an, economy, an economy that is well developed has the capacity to absorb the cost of copyright protection, whereas a, 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 an economy that is still developing does not have as much capacity to absorb the cost of copyright protection. And until you have that capacity, you would not be able to absorb the cost of copyright protection. And that capacity, uh, interestingly, comes from being able to access knowledge and being able to grow on your own terms as a country, which is what the United States and China did very well within the copyright system. So as developing countries continue to ascend in global copyright politics, they will continue to play a huge role in determining what are the policies that, we would that would shape the global copyright system would look like. And um, the future they are working towards is a future where access to knowledge will take a central stage, and also a future where an international copyright treaty on limitations and exceptions would emerge. This is um, a project that not only developing countries are committed to, but scholars like me are also committed to um, advancing and also uh, making the case for access to knowledge to take the center stage and for an international treaty on copyright limitations and exceptions to emerge. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you, Faith. Juliana Castro Varon, designer of our poster for tonight's event, writer, technologist, founder of the award winning publisher Cita Press, feminist, wonderful human. Come up here, tell us some things, show us what you felt. <laughs> Make it out it. Yeah. Um, I'm going to start this presentation with a story. William Mumler was born around 200 years ago here in Massachusetts, actually not too far from Boston. He was a photographer and a, a man whose story can be told two different ways. The first one is to say that he was an entrepreneur and an artist. Mumler ran a thriving business selling pictures. Pictures of people with their relatives, with their loved ones. He also created a unique way of development of images that would land him in the history books. The other way you could tell the story of Mumler is by saying that he was a crook and a cheater. <laughs> Mumler, well, he was a young man by the time the Civil War broke in the US. That means that he was alive in the late 1800s, a moment in which many people had lost their loved ones to the war. And that meant that as everything, every time that something horrible happens, there's space for profit. And he did profit. Mumler ran a thriving business selling pictures of ghosts. One of the most famous images is uh, this one of Mary Todd Lincoln and, you know, Lincoln's ghost. <laughs> at the time, at the time, these images looked very, very real. And people, people just wanted to believe that it was indeed real, that photography, this new camera photography by, by 1872 is relatively new. It's been a couple of decades since the moment people were able to see cameras for the very first time. It was not far-fetched to imagine that this camera was also able to take pictures of spirits. Today, if I tell you that this is indeed evidence of ghosts, I will have a very hard time convincing the people in this room, even if you believe in ghosts, which you could. That is because the gap knowledge has closed, the knowledge gap has closed between technology and literacy. What we know about cameras and what we know about ghosts, may, maybe, has changed since the 1800s to now. I've spent the last year here at the BKC studying the history of photographic manipulation, specifically the one used to deceive people and to tell lies and to profit. And I believe that looking at the tropes 
of the past can help us tackle the risks of the future, specifically the ones of artificial intelligence. And so, because I encountered dozens of examples, I decided to put them in context, and I did what I enjoy doing best. I built a website. <laughs> this is a website that is real, and you are able to visit it right now, but I'm gonna walk you through it. Don't go into your computers. I found a number of tropes that repeat over time. What are those tropes? First, make yourself look better. Use image manipulation to look taller, more independent, more beautiful. King George I was erased from a picture of Canadian Prime Minister just so that he would look more influential by being standing alone with the Queen. A couple of years later, Benito Mussolini had the vanity, I guess, of erasing the horse handler. You can see it over there. I love this big, big screen. He got the horse handler raised so that he would look heroic, independent, able to handle the horse by himself like a big boy. <laughs> Trope number two of the history of image manipulation. Use manipulation to make others look bad. This is a fun one. In 1950, a couple of senators, they were on a little kind of vengeance fight and uh, Republican Senator Joseph McCarthy had allegedly, um, his campaign at least, had uh, Senator Tidings, which is the, uh, the man on the left, the thinner man on the left, um, erased, uh, sorry, uh, composed together with who was back then the head of the Communist Party, just in an attempt to drive the narrative that he was, of course, communist, something that we all know to be horrible. <laughs> Now, third trope in the history of image manipulation. Use images to perpetuate racist standards of beauty and unrealistic body expectations, specifically for women. In 1989, the TV guy put the head of Oprah in the body of Anne Margaret. As you can see here, they colored the image and put it on the cover. I, uh, they, of course, asked permission to none of the women. And this mark, the trend of the 90s and 2000s of not only the pressure for beauty and, thin and thinness, but of using image manipulation to sell something. In this case, to sell magazine. Right now, in 2023, we are juggling a whole new set of issues. We have beauty filters that are embedded in the Zoom calls and that automatically make everybody look beautiful, quote unquote beautiful. But I believe these motifs are present all throughout and until the present. Take La La Land. La La Land is a tech startup. So La La Land, the company, not La La Land, the movie. It's a, it's a European tech startup from, that started in 2019. And they promise, and I quote, to be able to offer clients the promise of more inclusive, sustainable, and digitally mandated brand. How? By offering a set of uh, models that people were able to hire by very, with very little money to make their, their presence more diverse. So for example, uh, if you sell t-shirts, you could hire La La Land so that many a diverse group of people would look like they are wearing your t-shirts. Now the catch is that, and you know where I'm going with this, these people are not real. They are artificially created, all of them. We have, of course, the trope of using image manipulation to drive a narrative of how beauty is supposed to look, specifically for non-white bodies in this case. But we also have the narrative of William Mumbler, the one in which on one side, La La Land is for many a, a company that has made money for their investors, a company that has many clients, Levi's is one of their famous clients, a successful company who saw a problem and tackle it. For others, specifically, 
models of color or people who have lost their jobs to this. They are a fraudulent crook and a cheater of a company, one that is profiting um, of the promise of diversity while not, well, not hiring the labor of, of people of color. The other thing here is important, and is that this image, unlike Mumler's image, looks quite real for us. The knowledge gap has not closed just yet. You can now visit ourimagesreal.com and play with this. I believe literacy matters. I went to undergrad for graphic design. I have been going through the whole three timelines that you can find on the website. Darkroom photography, which is not taught in art school anymore. Photoshop and digital technologies and artificial intelligence. I encountered from vengeance to horror to humor to weirdness and I invite you to take a look because I think you might too. Thank you so much. You have such a reading list and a, you know, a tick list of places you have to go and check out and read and explore. Um, we're so proud of this project. We're proud of you, Huli. Uh, Florian Martin Bartau, FMB. He's an associate professor of law of FMB. Um, associate professor of law in the University Research Chair in Technology and Society at the University of Ottawa. He's a technologist and a creative turned legal scholar. His research focuses on technology law, ethics, and policy with a special interest in AI, blockchain, quantum technologies, cybersecurity, whistleblowers, and intellectual property. FMB, take it away. Good evening, everybody. So the Northern Mockingbirds are known for to whistle in the darkest spaces. And to discuss a better future, to think of a better future, I want to share with you what I've been working on at BKC this year, looking into the important role of people working within the tech industry, as well as public interest security researchers who have been looking into the dark spaces of AI and blowing the, blowing the whistle on a variety of issues. Our lives are no digital, as we said with Elizabeth Dubois in the book that we edited together, and governed by algorithms. While promising considerable benefits, recent development in AI, obscure algorithms, have raised multiple legal, political, and ethical issues. Issues with respect to, to fundamental rights and the protection of those brave enough to disclose these issues. The de development of private AI systems across society and within government is causing a shift of power to new structures beyond the control of existing governance and accountability frameworks. These new governance, governors sorry, bring concerns for democracy and democratic freedoms to the forefront. Years of inactions have facilitated a socio-technical reality where the dominion of algorithms is di dictated by the choices of technologists and system architects, rather than the collective will and needs of society. There is a lack of transparency, oversight, and accountability on how AI systems are developed and how they can be used to the detriment of society. This is reinforced by increasing copyright and trade secrets protection and inaction with respect to anti-competitive behaviors that created the digital ecosystem governed by a few major players. Several whistleblowers and former employees unveiled mass evidence of deliberate malice and harmful choices that negatively impacted society. The failed internal governance models, infrastructure design choices, and, proper, and the lack of proper internal feedback loops enable design, uh, enable aid speech, spread misinformation, and promoted insurrections. These shortcomings have also amplified again and again harms to already marginalized communities. But this social technical reality was not inevitable. Governance framework and practice 
must evolve to balance information asymmetries from corporations toward the public. We tried several tools for us to One thing is for sure, ethical guidelines and technical standards are, have so far been ineffective. Some jurisdictions have adopted an, or proposed legal frameworks. Legal frameworks are very complex to design and even more complex to inf enforce, notably due to an informational asymmetry. To work with this obscurity, the latest legislative conversations in Canada, the US, or the EU push towards more transparency and documentation obligations. These requirements are a welcome initial step toward accountability. At least, they foster some sort of oversight. Yet, transparency, that kind of transparency, isn't without its flaws. First, it offloads the duty of awareness onto society, citizens, consumers. We need to be careful to not create an information overload that would transfer the burden to individuals and offer a get of jail card to industry. Second, it really provides actual useful disclosure and actually it often obfuscates malicious practices. The limited information released to meet the regulatory requirement is often unveiled as a corporate communication exercise, merged with red tape, layers of revision by an array of lawyers, and I'm one so I can say so, for compliance purposes. The recent logoria of transparency reports has unsuccessfully you know, mitigated the most pressing issues and concern. Although don't get me wrong, we need strong AI regulation with strong transparency and accountability standards. We need well-equipped regulators with cheap and auditing powers, especially in Canada, as well as staff and budget to lead such investigation and sanction. But in our toolkit for responsible AI, we need more. We must empower and protect workers who are familiar with the technical reality and design choices, those who were at the decision table, at the design table. I believe that a future of responsible AI will come from adequate protection for whistleblowers and security researchers. Whistleblowers are linked to some of the greatest scandal of our modern society. Concerned citizens have disclosed confidential information to the public to prevent or expose political, social, financial, technological, health wrongdoing. Extensive research demonstrates that whistleblowing is in the public and in the private sectors one of, if not the most common ways of unveiling wrongdoing. From Christopher Willey to Frances Hogan to Sophie Zhang, whistleblowers have revealed recent technological scandals and shown that those kind of disclosure are essential to protect our digital safety. The, the whistleblowers are essential to reveal ma major issues within the tech industry, but they lack protection, while they take tremendous personal risk to alert authorities and the public. And in my research, I've identified policy, legal, and digital literacy gaps. One notes, though, for sure, there must be a fair balance you know, between the public disclosure and the protection of trade secrets. Yet, I do believe that the public interest should trump the financial interest of a few privileged. Legal framework must evolve to better protect the public rather than reinforcing algorithmic power asymmetries through criminal law and trade secrets. We need legislative, criminal, and civil protection for whistleblowers. Very few states in the US and countries around the world provide such protection within the private sector. And even when they are, the framework are like extremely restrictive in terms of who is protected what kind of disclosure, to whom, for what. And even when there, sometimes there are like some civil exemption, there is often a criminal statute uh, or like some IP and trade secret laws that actually prohibit such disclosure. In addition, we also need to incentivize companies to have internal processes in place. It is often the case that workers must go public because the internal processes failed. Lately, in, with respect to generative AI, uh, teams have been disbanded after flagging that uh, a model was maybe too early to be released, that we need more extensive validation to avoid arming society, but it was playing against the financial interest of the, of the company. And so I'm working on uh, developing such legal framework and governance scheme. 
But beyond the, the, in, the workers within the companies, we need also to protect people outside of, the, of those companies. Most jurisdictions lack proper protection for well-intentioned security researchers to proceed with testing and disclosure, um, the testing and disclosure of vulnerabilities. Model on security bug bounties, we know have bias bounties and other sort of programs aiming at tackling bias and issues in AI, including one co-organized by one of the new big A serious removable AI fellow, uh, Roman Chaudhary. Uh, this is good, and we need more of those, but they are often in control environment and with the agreement of the companies. We need to make sure that those experts who have the knowledge and the will to help out society are able to look at the systems and model that are not willingly open to them. To them. And we need to, for them to be protected when they want to disclose the issues. For sure, it's very complex to design, but it's not impossible. Belgium just did it with CVDs, for example. And so I'm also working on drafting proposal of law reform to propose surf, uh, such safeguards. So for better digital future, I believe that trade secrets and NDA should be limited by the public interest. You know, it was one of the biggest issues that delayed the disclosures that led to the Me Too movement. This is, again, one of the biggest uh, issues for a responsible um, AI. And with the, in North America, we're kind of going backward following USMCA. Canada, for example, has been forced to pass new criminal legislation to protect trade secrets without any ex, uh, exemption. So as a result, most AI systems are criminally protected by a veil of obscurity, and it appears urgent to correct this oversight. And so my prediction, like for Elizabeth, is like, it's not gonna go in a better direction regarding AI system. We need to make sure that we have a full toolkit to protect society and as social technical system increasingly permeate every facet of our existence, influencing, influencing vital aspect of our lives and the very essence of our citizenry. For a better digital future, we need with sovereign security research protection. We need them to become imperative. They are like imperative and critical for our society. Thank you so much. And let's join the fight. Let's join the fight. Sorry. <laughs> Hi. Um, we're about halfway done. Just a little bit past. Did anybody learn anything about their futures from their hands? Anything good? We feeling all right? Woo! Does anybody want to read? Patrick uh, welcomes anybody to read his palm at the reception following the event, where you'll also have a chance to ask questions of the fellows. Dr. Ashley. Ashley Lee, PhD, is a computer scientist turned social scientist who studies AI, tech, politics, and social movements. Her current work examines the implications of technology, design, and use for democracy and social equality focusing on youth and marginalized communities. And um, hi everyone, um, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Ashley Lee, and my talk today is actually very much about uh, celebrating the here and now, um, though I can predict the future with all these crystal balls around as well. Um, I'm actually a computer scientist turned social scientist, and one big area of my research is about politics and ethics of technology. And I'm really interested in these questions uh, about you know, how do we design technologies that center the experiences um, and concerns of young people in marginalized communities. And one big part of that question is asking <laughs> how do we empower next generation technologists and citizens to co-create a pluriverse where multiple worlds can not only coexist but thrive. This question is important because in spite of all the potentials of technology to advance uh, the public interest, 
Uh, recent events have highlighted some of the challenges that tech has posed for democracy and global civil society, um, both in terms of its design and use. And so, for instance, you can think of the Cambridge Analytica scandal um, and many other projects around the world. Uh, or the spread of hate speech um, you know, that has escalated to mass-scale violence, uh, such as in the case of the Rohingya genocide. And movements like Black Lives Matter are targeted uh, by disinformation campaigns all the time, um, you know, which are used to sow doubt and confusion and, and division among civil society actors. Um, and then there are all these new uh, concerns around black box algorithms that are increasingly governing all areas of our lives, including such as whether we get to, um, you know, whether we get a job or a loan or how much we, we pay for health insurance, things like that. And so these are all very important questions that um, you know many of us are working on here at the Klein Center. And um, as digital platforms come, in, uh, come to govern our everyday lives, um, all aspects of our lives, really. So um, I started my career as a software engineer and um, in Silicon Valley after studying computer science at Stanford. And what, when I was in college, tech ethics uh, wasn't really a thing. <laughs> so for a long time, algorithms were uh, primarily thought of in terms of efficiency and accuracy, right? And um, the assumption was that computer science is a value-neutral, non-political field, right? Yet these events that I just highlighted for you um, demonstrate that technology is inherently political. The process of making and deploying technology uh, is products are political, right? So um, who's designing? Who's at the table, right? Who gets to code? Who gets to set the agenda? These are all value-laden questions um, that are inherently political and raises difficult questions about political power and resource allocation. Yet until recently, um, there hasn't been a formal training for computer scientists um, on social, social and ethical dimensions of computing. Right? And this has changed rapidly um, in recent years. There's now what we might even call a movement for ethical tech, um, and computer science departments and other uh, related departments around the country and around the world are uh, introducing computer science ethics programs and initiatives um, to uh, their schools. So for instance, uh, Stanford started a computer science ethics program um, in the last couple of years. Um, Harvard also has a computer science ethics program. So in my own research, I've been exploring how universities can better prepare next generation technologists to navigate ethical challenges at work. Um, and this involves asking questions, uh, not only about how a technologist can navigate ethical challenges at work, but also asking big picture questions about you know, the workforce and the work environment, right? So right now, the default path for many uh, CS grads is from uh, the university to big tech and the industry, right? So, so why, right? Even as the public interest tech continues to rise. Um, and there are all these questions around, you know, diversity, like how do we attract and retain emerging technologists from underrepresented groups, right? And the questions around tech ethics are embedded within these macro level questions around the power that's uh, concentrated in Silicon Valley um, and other tech hubs around the country and in other uh, Western, mostly Western uh, countries, and the power that they exert globally. So, in my research, I've been uh, working together with student uh, researchers. Um, um, here at Harvard and Stanford, oops. So the two uh, institutions that I've been affiliated with recently to explore ways to empower emerging technologists and to center uh, young people's perspectives. And so I wanted to acknowledge uh, the contributions of my co-researchers, um, one of them who's here, Autumn, my dear friend, Sarah Ray. Um, and um, so in addition to uh, 
uh, this kind of participatory action research. Uh, the project also has a classic social science uh, components, which I won't go into uh, to too much detail at the moment, but I'm also happy to talk about that um, during the reception. Um, so one of the things that we're uh, really doing as part of this project is constructing a set of teaching case studies that college students can use either on their own or uh, in the classrooms to discuss tech ethics issues. And these teaching cases address difficult real-world challenges that professionals are grappling with uh, in their everyday work life, right? So, um, and here are some of the Berkman Klein Center um, colleagues who are contributing uh, their uh, teaching cases, some of whom are here today, some of whom you are actually hearing from. So a quality that I admire about the work of these case authors is that they are, they're, they're bringing uh, this deep lived knowledge and experiences of the challenges that their own communities are facing. And they're really uh, trying to, um, you know, these are difficult questions that don't have clear answers, right? Um, given all the power structures and the ways in which uh, things are set up, right? So these are ongoing questions that uh, we are trying to um, engage students uh, with uh, through uh, teaching cases, right? And this is especially important uh, when we consider how technology has um, gone wrong when we are, you know, when people are trying to solve other people's problems, right? Um, and so, and, and further, technology and ethics pedagogy today um, currently has a, a tendency to center on U.S. and Western contexts. And our goal with these uh, teaching cases is to broaden the horizon to include international and transnational contexts and center the perspectives of communities that are often left out of important debates around technology and society. So ultimately, um, if we are to work toward a uh, pluriverse where many, uh, where a world where many worlds fit, right, as the Zapatistas say, we need to be able to recruit and retain a diverse workforce and cultivate inclusive work environments that can sustain them. And tech ethics pedagogy needs to reflect the diversity of uh, worldviews. So that's the kind of future that I would like to see. And in doing this work, I'm building on the work of many other, uh, many others, including uh, colleagues and friends um, and mentors, some of whom are here today. And so I want to take a moment to celebrate their work, uh, the work of my colleagues and change makers around the world. So now let me close with a few acknowledgements. I'm incredibly grateful to um, Berkman Klein Center for giving me the platform to do this work. And I, I, I would like to thank, you, uh, thank especially uh, Becca, uh, Nadia, Patrick, Sia, Liz, Sue, and the entire BKC team for your support throughout my fellowship. And I would also like to acknowledge um, colleagues at Stanford Pax, Stanford uh, McCoy Family Center, and Harvard Ash Center for uh, providing with ongoing support of this work as well. So finally, um, in case I didn't mention, this work is going to continue uh, on. And if you're interested in getting involved uh, in uh, various capacities, I would love to hear from you. Thank you. Good call to action, Ashley. Thank you so much. It's been our privilege. Marta, this is Jack. Marta, come on up here. Marta is a lawyer with extensive experience in public sector reforms in the Ukraine, has supported state institutions, civil society, and international organizations to improve the quality of governance. At, Mar at BKC, Marta has been studying success drivers for digital transformation and education, aiming to enhance human capital development. Marta, it's been our privilege to have you. Let's hear it from you. Thank you so much. 
so very much. Hi everyone, and uh, thank you so much for being here. Yep. <laughs> I better hold it. You want to? Okay. Thank you so much. So, so as you can, can see today, I want to talk about human capital future and the role of digital education. So let me start with talking about digital transformation, which is now not just seen as a competitive advantage for employment opportunities or, in general, economic growth. But now it is the key driver for, I believe, um, addressing many issues and for meeting people's needs. And when we are talking about issue, I mean cybersecurity, disinformation, inequalities, but also even amplified impact of climate change. At the same time as we embrace digital uh, transformation, it is crucial that we think about technology with great caution. Because, let's be honest, they provide great opportunities but also carry great risks. And here, um, I would like all of us to think about two principal questions. First, how do we engage with digital technology, not just effectively, but also confidently and responsibly, for different purposes? And then second question, how do we ensure that digital technology can actually uphold human rights, can uphold rule of law democracy while giving everyone the benefits to reap, uh, to enjoy the benefits of digital transformation? So the question at, at hand is, how do we make sure that digital transformation is successful? And I believe one of the key pillars for that is actually digital competence, which in turn, as you can see, consists of three elements, not just digital skills, but also digital knowledge and digital attitudes. I believe that digital competence should not just be limited to proficiency in knowing how we use digital technology, but also we need to understand um, what are the benefits, what are the limitations um, of digital technology, and how we can use it in an ethical and confident manner. So, how can we effectively develop and boost digital competence for everyone? And here I believe education sector has a decisive role to play. But in order to meet those high expectations, we need to change the nature how education sector functions uh, so that it can fully include all individuals in a, let's face it, now we all live in a, a digital driven society. So here at BKC, I've been examining uh, digital transformation of many countries with respect to transformations of the education sector. And I identified several factors that I believe are crucial to include in na national strategy of those countries who wants to transform digitally their education sector and uh, ensure that everyone can be equipped with the necessary level of digital skills. So when we think about digital education, Many of us just picture the application of different digital technologies in delivering education. And here, in this picture, you can see a Ukrainian professor who is now bravely defending Ukraine's independence. But in this picture, he is not conducting any military operation. He is actually delivering a lecture to his students over Zoom uh, software. Or let's have another example of extended reality that is now crucial in Ukraine uh, aviation training because it simulates the real flight and it provides an opportunity to build skills that are necessary for pilots more effectively and without any risks for their safety. So the conclusion is there are many digital technologies that um, provide many opportunities and I have to be honest, I wanted to include more photos with pictures of Ukrainians whom I just want to say that I owe everything to, who is now fighting for Ukraine. But I, I'm very short with my time, so I have to move on. And the main thing is to realize that the application of digital technologies in education is only one aspect. And we need other factors that have to be considered and then implemented simultaneously. So what are the factors? No? Okay. Sorry for that. Digital infrastructure. Uh, in Norway, it actually consists of three elements. First element, we need to think about deployment of network to all educational institutions, but also to all households. The second element, it's about the 
It's about the deployment of physical infrastructure and equipment that here is very important. need to comply with security rules, with maintenance rules, and then with data protection rules. And the third element I found particularly interested, interesting because uh, Norway is now investing in cloud technologies. They want to uh, come up with an open and uh, multidisciplinary environment to provide all interested parties, including researchers, companies, individuals, uh, to have this opportunity to, to find reused data, publish articles, and have access to different tools and services. While digital uh, technologies, availability and access are crucial, institutions also have a role to play. They need to make uh, changes, and uh, they need to make systemic changes to encourage purposeful use of digital technologies. So the third element is about building digital capacity in all educational institutions. What does it mean? It means optimizing and then integrating digital technologies. But here is very important, not just in learning and teaching, but also in the assessment and other operational activities. Um, so in Ireland, they highlighted two important elements. One of them is digital uh, leadership, where they require all digital leaders to explain and then continuously communicate the vision and that objective why digital technology is necessary and how it will benefit the educational institution. And the second element is about institutional development plans for achieving the set objective and then for avoiding any um, challenges that were identified. Another crucial factor after digital capacity is about digital competencies, but here very specifically it relates to all educators and then to all staff who work at the educational institution. So most European countries have already adopted strategies uh, where they want to build effective system for their initial training and then ongoing professional development. And Sweden even is now in the process of launching new uh, national professional program for all school leaders and all teachers in the entire country. In addition to that, what is important is digital educational content, which in my favorite digital country, Estonia, <laughs> includes curriculum, smart learning resources, but also digital pedagogy. I would like just to briefly note that uh, Estonia is known for many things when it comes to digital transformation, but in particular, uh, with respect to digital transformation of education, they are brilliant in private-public pub collaboration. During pandemic, they uh, worked closely with over 70 organizations and companies to provide free access to digital, um, digital education solutions. And now those solutions have become an integral part of their national education system, which is awesome. Another example comes from my home country, Ukraine. For those who don't know, Ukraine is now on the mission to build one of the most digital friendly, friendly country. And they are doing it through now an award-winning e-government platform, which is called DIA. In English, it means action. But following the full-scale Russian invasion, they decided that they need to do more with respect to digital education. So they decided to set up a separate platform, which is called DIA, Digital Education. The main goal is to equip everyone of all ages with the necessary level of digital skills. And of course, there is a, a lot of work to be done ahead. There will be lots of experimentations, there will be lots of uncertainties and challenges. But what is clear is a strong commitment that we need to optimize technology for a thriving future, one that serves people and where public interest drives innovation. Finally, my last factor that I think is crucial is life learning, lifelong learning concept, which basically means that digital education should not be limited just to a certain group of people or to a certain phase of life. It should be accessible in various contexts and at different levels, regardless of age or learning environment that people may be in. So at this point, I know many of you are thinking, okay, what about the risks, the challenges or downsides? And I, I won't lie, there will be many and just to name a few, digital divide, inequality, gender imbalance, skill gaps, mismatches, labor shortages, then data surveillance, cybersecurity. I mean, there will be lots. 
Um, but to mitigate and hopefully eradicate some of those risks, what will be important that the entire process of digital transformation of education is guided by internationally recognized human rights and principles, which also uh, backed up by the national respective regulations. So as I need to wrap up, because I feel like I'm already talking too much, um, okay, I really like the picture, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> When we are talking and thinking about the transformation of digital education, it will take a wide system and multi-stakeholder approach with continuous collaboration, uh, adaptation, and then uh, monitoring. And that's when I believe we all can come in. Because when you're thinking, okay, what I can do, and I really don't know what's happening to me, um, there are several ways. You can not only support Ukraine on its way to digital transformation of education, but you can also help your own country. Or you can help with building digital capacity within your own organization. Or as a last resort, you can actually start with yourself and try to improve digital competencies. When I'm thinking about the future, I know that many of us are very concerned about it. But the fact is that the future is the thing that is being created now, in the present. And it is created by those people who actually see opportunities and then take actions. And I believe that the transformation of digital education is one of such opportunities. From my professional experience, I know that reforms are never easy, but they are achievable. And I know that education is one of the reforms that are without any doubts necessary. So what is important is to keep moving forward. And this picture is actually a picture where I want to thank BKC very much for the fact that the initial steps in that direction for my country were taken here. I'm incredibly honored to be part of this community and I hope we can all become champions of human capital through the power of digital education together. Thank you so much. Ukraine's finest. We stand with you, Marta. We stand with Ukraine to people on the move all over, to people who um, are repressed, to people who are fighting the good fights. Thank you for being with us this year. Um, which brings us to artificial borders, and it brings us to Petra Molnar, who's a lawyer and an anthropologist. She co-runs the Refugee Law Lab at York University and the Migration Technology Monitor and is writing her first book, Artificial Borders. Petra. Like a wound in the landscape, a rusty border wall cuts along our Arizona's El Camino del Diablo, or the Devil's Highway. You can drive up to it and touch it, the rust staining your hand for the rest of the day. Parts of the wall are also painted black so that it absorbs the scorching sun of the Sonora, making it painful to touch and to climb. Once the pride and joy of the Trump administration, this wall is once again the epicenter of a growing political row. Last Thursday, President Biden repealed the Trump administration's COVID-era Title 42 regulation, which prevented people from exercising their internationally protected right to asylum. But what comes now, however, is the introduction of even more hardline policies, making it even more difficult for people and also undergirded by growing commitment to a virtual smart border that extends far beyond this physical frontier. 
Today, there are millions of people on the move due to forces of colonialism, imperialism, conflict, instability, environmental factors, and economic reasons. But through every point of a person's migration journey, they are impacted by risky, unregulated technology used to control movement and manage migration. I spent the last six years now tracking how new technologies of border management, surveillance, automated decision-making, and various experimental projects, how they're playing out in people's lives. And in order to tell this global story of power and violence and innovation and contestation, I rely on the sometimes uneasy mix of law and anthropology. It's a slow and a trauma-informed way of thinking, one which requires years of being present in a space in order to begin unraveling at least some of the strands of power and privilege and story and memory that make up the spaces where people's lives unfold. And knowledge production and storytelling is also a deeply political act, one that I do not engage with in without constant reflection and a recommitment towards building a world without violent technological regimes. Because I've had the privilege to see time and again across different contexts, from Palestine to Greece to the US-Mexico border, that an already violent border policy is often sharpened through the use of digital technologies developed for the purposes of border control. These technologies separate families, push people into life-threatening terrain, and exacerbate historical and systemic discrimination that is a daily reality for people on the move. From robo-dogs to AI lie detectors to drone surveillance to high-tech refugee camps, borders have increasingly become a testing ground for new technologies. Because they're places where regulation is deliberately limited and where an anything goes frontier attitude really does inform the development and deployment of surveillance at the expense of people's lives. I would like to share one particular vignette with you to illustrate their impact on real people. Since 2020, before coming to BKC, I had been mostly based in Greece and along the edges of Europe, one of the major frontier sites of the EU and a testing ground for much of this border technology management. And the region of Evros is what separates Greece from Turkey. Almost as a pilgrimage, when I'm in the region, I make the drive down to Sidero, a small village near the town of Sufli. It's really beautiful. It's flanked by golden poplar trees that cut through the landscape. And outside the small village lies a cemetery of mostly unmarked graves. Three or four have some inscriptions that were sent to the local imam who takes care of this final resting place by the families of the deceased. And last time I was there, I touched the fresh earth on one of these graves. It was that of a young woman who died on the 2nd of February, 2021, only a few months before my visit there. Amal was born in 1993, and decayed bouquets of yellow roses were still on top of her grave, a remnant, perhaps, of an act of recognition and an act of care. But while I was kneeling down paying my respects, something caught my eye, something green and putrid, standing water in holes that were gnawed out of the earth, Three open graves await. This is the region where experimental new technology is playing out. Drone surveillance, sound cannons that emit piercing shrieks, and various algorithmic motion detection risk assessments, and even virtual reality glasses for the border guards to wear. All of these technologies have profound impacts on people's human rights and civil liberties from privacy rights being impacted when data is shared with repressive governments, or when international organizations share such data, to of course freedom of movement and the right to seek asylum, to one's right to life, liberty, and security of the person when various border violence regimes are practiced and aided through surveillance technology. But what is really clear is that in the opaque and discretionary world of border enforcement, these are structures that are underpinned by intersecting systemic racism and historical discrimination against people migrating. These technological impacts are very real. But what's extremely troubling is that there's virtual no, virtually no governance mechanisms in place to regulate the development and deployment of these high-risk technological experiments. And what I argue and see time and time again is that this creation of this lack of governance is very deliberate because it allows for the border to be the ultimate testing ground, a high-risk laboratory. 
and it also allows for these projects to occur that would simply not be allowed in other spaces. Imagine if you had to sit in front of an AI lie detector at your doctor's office, or if robo dogs were deployed in your local grocery store. But why does this matter? Well, because these technologies are becoming normalized beyond borders. Just a few weeks ago, New York City's police department proudly unveiled their newest arsenal of robo-dogs that will be running around the streets of New York, one even painted with spots like a Dalmatian. Very cute. But when and why have we decided these are the appropriate tools to use in our society, particularly when we know that there's inadequate governance and accountability mechanisms in places for when things go wrong? Whose perspectives matter when talking about innovation and which priorities take precedence? There's also the money factor. There's big money to be made in the development and selling of highest technology. Why does the private sector time and again get to determine what we innovate on and why in often really problematic partnerships with the public sector? Whose priorities really matter when we choose to create violent sound cannons robo-dogs or AI lie detectors instead of using AI to root out racist border guards. It's because technology perpetuates power differentials in society. And unfortunately, the viewpoints of those most affected are routinely excluded from the discussion. And at the end of the day, this conversation isn't really just about technology. It's about these broader questions. Questions around which communities get to participate in conversations around proposed innovation and which groups of people become the testing grounds for tech experiments. So not to leave this on a very depressing note, how do we build a different world? I want to share a little example of a little project that we've been putting together called the Migration and Technology Monitor. It's an archive, a platform, and a community that actively decenters so-called global north narratives and pushes resources into communities who are mobile. You can check out our archive. It's available in Arabic, Spanish, French, and English, hopefully Dari soon as well. But I want to highlight one particular element of uh, this work, and that is our newly launched fellowship program for people on the move. We have Veronica, Neri, Weil, Rajendra, and Simon joining us this year for our first ever cohort. And they are people on the move in situations of displacement who want to tell their own stories on border surveillance. They will be doing original reporting on surveillance applications at the US-Mexico border, uh, looking at using WhatsApp as a way to communicate with refugees in Venezuela, and creating a memory scroll archive in Uganda, really recentering power of people on the move to tell their own stories. Because ultimately, it is this deep, slow, and grounded community work that can act as a method of resistance to the vast power differentials that are inherent in the development and deployment of technology. And for me, it's also a commitment to this community work that allows us to build a safer, kinder world like the BKC community has done for me this year. Thank you. Um, wow. Wow, I'm so proud of you all. I'm so grateful to you all. Um, in the spirit of fortune telling, I had planned to join us this evening in a giant magic eight ball costume. A giant one, like big, round, 3D. It had a, a thing with batteries and a fan that would have kept it um, big and round. But they didn't send that. Instead, they sent um, these green shoes. Why? Unclear. Um, they're not my size, which is unfortunate, because I would wear them otherwise. Um, I'm sure the magic eight ball would have predicted what just happened, um, that seven brilliant people got up here and shared things that we learned from that made us feel, that made us think, that helped us to predict futures that we want to belong to and that we want to change. Um, that technology would work some, that it wouldn't work some, that we would laugh. Um, but these green shoes, they're not ruby slippers, but they'll remind me that there's no place 
like BKC, <laughs> there's no fellows like you. Um, thank you so much to you all. Thank you, you all, for coming and joining us tonight. It's still light out. Um, but we invite you to join us to the fifth floor, to the Berkman Klein Center offices, where there's food, where there's snacks, where the fellows will be. There's a beautiful porch. Come and sit on it. Get your son. Get a drink. Get a snack. Um, and continue to imagine and to predict the world we want to live in. Thank you all. <laughs>